something very interesting has been discovered at the bottom of the planet's oceans. A particular type of deep sea hydrothermal vent known as alkaline hydrothermal vents. We think that ancient vents, similar to these, in the oceans of a young Earth were the birthplace of life on our planet. The early ocean of the Earth, some four billion years ago, was acidic and rich in carbon dioxide, while the deep sea vents spewed out an alkaline fluid full of hydrogen. Inside the vents, the alkaline hydrothermal fluids and acidic oceans mixed in a labyrinth of micropores. The difference in pH allowed the carbon dioxide and hydrogen to react across the thin membranes when otherwise they would be unreactive. Deep sea hydrothermal vents could have powered the original chemical transformation of carbon dioxide and hydrogen into simple organic molecules. Molecules such as amino acids, fats and proteins, the fundamental building blocks of life. Nick Lane's group are working to recreate these early Earth conditions in their lab. So life is a continuous chemical reaction. We need to continuously be burning food in oxygen just to live. All life, all cells work in basically exactly the same way. The chemical reaction can be different, but the actual mechanism of what's going on is amazingly similar right across all of life. It's as unifying as the genetic code itself. It's taking the energy from this continuous reaction and using it to pump protons across a membrane. So we end up with a high proton concentration. That's the, the, the positively charged nuclei of hydrogen atoms. We have a high concentration on one side of this membrane and a low concentration on the other side. As these protons flow down through the membrane, they power everything that cells do right across all of life. And what's beautiful about this particular environment, these alkaline hydrothermal vents, is that they have a natural analogue to this. They have natural barriers, very, very thin inorganic barriers with high concentrations of protons on one side, low concentrations on the other side. And this can, in theory, power all the reactions needed for life. So this is a simple benchtop reactor which is intended to simulate the conditions uh, in, in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans. We have hydrogen gas in, in alkaline hydrothermal fluids entering into an acidic ocean, so full of, of carbon dioxide. For their lab experiments, the team use an anaerobic hood so they can control the atmosphere. So this is our reactor working in the anaerobic chamber. We have alkaline fluid flowing up into the acid fluid which creates precipitates. We can change the pH, the flow rate and the temperature with uh, this setup which means we can change different conditions in the experiment. The team analysed their results using a process called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Each molecule fragments in a different way. Each molecule creates a, a, a unique fingerprint. And knowing that, we can identify exactly which molecules were present in the initial um, complex sample. And essentially, that's many formaldehydes bound together. That's five formaldehydes bound together through the reaction we want to do. These early steps, forming organic molecules, look promising. But if these molecules are released into the cold ocean, they're quickly lost. Any organics produced need to be retained and concentrated within the vents to drive further reactions and eventually form living cells. Heat can concentrate these organics by a process called thermophoresis. So in this experiment, we're looking to simulate the inside of the alkaline hydrothermal vent so to do this, we constructed this ceramic foam, which is microporous, so it has the same kind of internal structure as the vent system. What we're looking to do is to flow organics into this foam at a very low concentration, and then to concentrate those up using temperature gradients via a process called thermophoresis. We've run this experiment previously. We've taken an organic fluorescein, which is UV active. We can then look at that under a UV light. We've seen concentration up to 5,000 times. And using other molecules, we've seen concentrations up to 30 million. At high concentrations, organic molecules interact among themselves in predictable ways, forming larger structures that are more stable than random mixtures. Lipids, one of the key building blocks of cells, are a great example of how this self-organization of organic matter works. These are molecules that have um, dual nature. Half of them likes to be in water, the other half doesn't. So what we have here is a dry layer of lipids, the material which is the constituent of the cell membrane. There we 
go, that's the water coming. Because they have to accommodate both needs of the same molecules, then they end up creating a self-assembling process. So they come together and they form a structure that typically is a membrane. And you can start to see vesicles forming on the edges. And this is very much the first requirement to create that chemical pool separation which I was talking about to have a life emerging. These two processes, the synthesis and concentration of organic molecules and their spontaneous self-organization into larger structures, can explain the context for how life might start, here or elsewhere in the universe. But how common are these conditions throughout the cosmos? Serpentinization, the process that forms alkaline hydrothermal vents, should happen on any wet, rocky planet. From this perspective, the universe should be teeming with simple cells. We can look for suitable conditions on other planets outside the solar system by using infrared space telescopes in a process called spectroscopy. We can ascertain the major components of the atmosphere of these planets, including water and carbon dioxide, by tiny shifts in light absorbance as an exoplanet transits its star. Twinkle is a UK space mission that will look at planets outside our solar system orbiting stars which are different from our own sun. And it will serve the atmosphere of these planets, try to understand what they're made of, what's the weather like there, what are the seasonal variation, what's the temperature, and so potentially understand whether some of them are more habitable than others. Missions like Twinkle are beginning to show that these conditions are widespread throughout the galaxy on as many as 40 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way alone. Wherever life starts in the universe, we can be fairly certain it requires a reactive environment. That's what we need to look for in planetary atmospheres, is, is potential reactivity. Molecules that want to react together, uh, but haven't yet, 